with puberty, sexual maturation, and the great, I ended on this, the great variance that we see among individuals when it comes to puberty and the characteristics that go along with sexual maturation. So this is an example of all these females are actually almost 15, and all these males are, sorry, the other way around, the males are almost 15, the females are almost 13. There's a lot of variability. You can see in body hair, in sexual genital development, in proportions, in size, in height, in growth spurts. There's a lot of variance in this. There's also stages of how clinicians and doctors will categorize or stage different um, phases of puberty. They'll look at the development of pubic hair, they'll look at breast bud development, scrotal size, uh, penis size. They'll sort of look at all those things to kind of map out what stage of puberty that individual is in. So going from stage one to stage five with more pubic hair on the moms, of course, accumulating with more advanced puberty. And the same thing with breast development, going from no breast development tissue at all to buds to actual breast tissue. Um, so these are kind of in stages. This is how doctors will stage one through four. So the tanner stages and stages of breast development. And also external genital development, the same thing. Sort of more undescended testes, not as large, and then the increasing growth with the external genitals. There's a lot of variability among people, but there is sort of averages or average ranges where most females will start and go through puberty and most males will start and go through puberty. <coughs> and we're gonna look at those. What we do know is that these hormones that we've been talking about, GnRH, awakening the anterior pituitary, causing its release, FSH and LH, that telling the gonads to start making the sex steroids, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, androgens, that all starts ramping up at puberty. So if we look at FSH, it's in percent micrograms. This sort of describes what that is. Just a unit of amount of concentration in the blood. And in both, let's see, the blue is FSH, the red is LH. It's looking at how these increase with age among a population of females. They really start to go up around 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then they kind of plateau out between 16, 18, and on. So the highest amount that we find, the percentage of these in the blood is highest during the times of puberty. And this is kind of just total, not looking how it's being pulsed, but this is just the total quantity that's in the blood when it's sampled at these different ages. Same thing with estradiol, nanogram percentage. It goes up significantly starting around 10, 11, about 11, it really starts to go up and reaches a maximum peak around 14 or 15. So this is the average among a bunch of females that were analyzed. <coughs> Same thing with males. These male hormones increase at puberty. LH, FSH, not as high as in the female, and there's some kind of spikes that go along with that, but it increases, especially in the puberty teenage years. Same thing with testosterone, very low to non-existent. And then around 11, 12, it starts going up. This is an anagram percentage again of testosterone in the blood, maximizing out typically in the late adolescent years, so 16, 17, 18 years old. All right, so all these are going up. These hormones are going up in the bodies of individuals going through puberty or sexual maturation. Something interesting, a lot of these studies first looked at GnRH, LHF, and FSH, and sex steroids in things like sheep and mice and rats and cows because we can study those fairly easily we can take blood samples, we can analyze what's going on with their sexual maturation, and it's easier th than doing that in humans. So a lot of these experiments, physiology usually starts with animals. So let's look at other mammals, see what's happening, and then see if that holds true in humans. We can't poke and prod humans as easily as we can animals, even if you're against animal testing. A lot of the stuff we know comes from using animals because we just can't do some things to humans. So we started realizing, oh, and a lot of other animals, mammals, that when they reach puberty, they have the GnRH spiking and it starts getting pulsed. And that leads to LH pulsing in the blood. And this really ramps up, especially during puberty and especially during sleep, okay? So this is like human data looking at LH in the blood over time. So where they actually were detecting, taking blood samples and detecting levels of LH in the blood and its height, its peak in amount. So this is LH during childhood. There's little, it's very low, little small spikes, sort of continuous, it's very, nothing dramatic. Mid to early puberty, so this onset of puberty to mid puberty, it starts spiking, it gets higher in concentration. We went from about three to now it's peaked to about 10. 
Notice that it's really maximizing and getting really dramatic during sleep. Okay, during sleep, the brain is putting out GnRH in peaks, pulses, and that is causing LH to be released in pulses during sleep. And then it's a little lower. It's still higher than in childhood, but it has pulses and it lowers down a little bit in non-sleep hours. Mid to late puberty, so approaching the end of kind of the pubescent period, it's even higher, more dramatic pulses. Again, the most dramatic sort of during sleep. Still lots of pulses and higher than childhood during puberty. And then post-puberty, <coughs> adult, so all of us in here are around here. We have kind of surges or cycling of LH that goes up and down, and it's somewhere in the you know, five to 10 range. Notice at the end of puberty, it's all the way up to like 20. So it's down, we're about half that throughout the rest of our life. But it goes in pulses, it goes in cycles. And notice it's not really associated with sleep. It doesn't just primarily happen the highest levels during sleep. It happens all the time, sort of throughout the circadian 24 hour clock time or period. So we started to realize, oh, during sleep, sleep is very important. During puberty and these pulses of GnRH and hence LH, because that triggers the release of the other one, that happens the most dramatically and the highest during sleep. I got on the cards, one of you asked, connection between stress and sleep? What, what is that? Connection between stress and sleep or the pineal gland? Well, if you're really, really stressed out, a lot of that stress, the stress signals come into the brain, that could mess up how the hypothalamus and the pineal gland are working and processing, right? And if your pineal gland isn't secreting melatonin normally, if you don't have enough melatonin secreted in nice big bursts all throughout the darkness or throughout the night, what's gonna happen? You can't sleep, you're gonna have insomnia. You're not gonna be able to sleep. Stress will feed directly in and affect the hypothalamus and the pineal and go, what the hell's going on? Just all that gets disrupted. So you will see GnRH cycles get disrupted. That can affect fertility and cycling and puberty. And melatonin can get disrupted. And if that is enough broken or not being secreted enough, you won't sleep. You'll have broken sleep. You won't be able to sleep as good. Okay? So you see stress and some of these things can feed right into sleep and other hormonal sort of patterns. If we look at the age of menarche, so let's go back. What's that menarche? What does menarche mean? First period. Perfect. Okay. First period, first menstrual cycling. You know, you had an ovulation. There's a menstrual flow. Everybody remembers that for the most part. And, you know, that's, that's a very signifying thing in a woman's life, right, or a girl's life. We know that the age of menarche, that first menstrual cycling, has gone down dramatically in the last several centuries. So going back from the 1800s to this is only in the 80s right here. There's other recent data, but this is just a chart showing up to 1980. This is going, we have data points 16, 17 years old, 18 years old, all the way down, down, down. If we do a linear regression, that just means the best fit of the data. The data actually, this line goes way, way, way down. Now, actually, this is about 12.3, where it's at, sort of in the 80s, was about 12.3 years old, going down from about 16 to 18 years old. And now we know that it's even a little earlier. This book and some sources say, oh, it's holding still about 12.3. It's a little lower than that. Actually, it's about 12.1. I study this. This is one of the research areas that I focus on, okay? So it's closer, and depending on whether you're European or Caucasian, European descent, or uh, African American, or Asian, or Latina, there's little variance in menarche and when that timing is, based on your sort of ethnic and geographical origin, and cultural, and all these other factors that sort of go into that. But on average, we'll say it's a little over 12 years old, so it has dropped dramatically, okay? So I wanna take a second here and just pause, because I wanna probe your brains a little bit, and sort of see why do you think the average age of anarchy or puberty, specifically that first cycling, that's how we can measure, it's real easy to measure, why has that declined so much in the last decades and in the last centuries? Why has that declined so much? Okay, so we'll stop. I'll let you guys work on that for a second. Stop this.